a different sense of opportunity. Um, and what I'm just going to talk about now reflects really quite a lot of thinking that we've been doing here in the West Midlands with West Midlands Rail Exec, we at SLC Rail, um, we, are, uh, we, we produced their 30 year rail investment strategy and we actually produced the rail strategies for Warwickshire, Worcestershire, Coventry, Leicestershire. So a lot of your patch, we've produced the rail strategies for your county councils. Um, uh, but we're thinking with all of them, what does all of this mean? Um, I kind of like the do, re, mi, you know, in, in the sound of music, but what does it mean? What does it really mean? And these are just thoughts rather than um, prescriptions, because I think it's all way too new for us to know what to do. I mean, I suppose, you know, in a sense, it is like this. It's like we, we've gone away to the moon and we're looking back at the earth again and thinking, well, what on earth do we do? How do we manage the earth? It's a radically changing world. This was one of the, the books about, I think, the 14th century when I was a history undergraduate. And I just loved the title, The World We Have Lost. And I think the world that kind of changed on March the 23rd is an irretrievable world in the form that it was in. Um, as we've just touched on, we're all now working fundamentally differently. Although how long we can all tolerate working at home all the time and the boundaries being lost between work and home life um, and not engaging in, in, in ordinary social interaction is an interesting question and a psychological question. I suspect there'll be many psychology books written in the next few years about the impact upon us all. It's also got the threat of a depression. I mean, you know, the government is, is doing everything it can to sustain people now. Um, but there is, I would, I would say, around the world, a genuine threat of uh, serious Great Depression. And, you know, again, when one looks at those pictures from America in the 1930s, I, I sort of look at that, that dust bowl cloud as it bringing fear and anxiety and uncertainty, which is ultimately where we all are now. So I, I tend to see that, you know, it's a revolution, really, with um, whatever the new normality is that's to come. Um, and as you can see from the, the, the range of, of words on the right hand side, it's a, it's a series of fundamental changes to the way we organise the world, to the way commerce functions, to the way the geography of development will happen, to our whole cultural, behavioural and personal ways of living. Now, past responses to major challenges like this included major infrastructure investment. If one looks at America, um, uh, and we look in the in the 1930s, uh, there were the whole sort of public works approaches that Roosevelt um, uh, delivered and made happen. And that, that both kept employment, it kept uh, the country moving, it kept people from starving and it kept things happening. And the same actually happened here, very close to home. So when you actually look at the Leamington Spa to Birmingham route that I said I grew up on, it was quadrupled. The tracks were taken from two track to four track uh, by the Great Western in 1933 and 1934. And that right hand picture, by the way, is just showing two of the heaviest engines that the Great Western had going over the one new bit of the bridge to make sure it could take the load. But that was partly funded by government. And in some ways, you know, it was saying, I think as Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are doing now, you know, there is a stark choice between people being unemployed and um, us having to fund them and being employed and us having to fund them and to do useful things. So when we go back to HS2 or anything like that, one of the questions today, I suppose, if I was in Boris Johnson's shoes would be, well, if I cancel it, I'm going to put another load of people out of work. That's another, another key thing about infrastructure projects. So, you know, back in the time when Johnson made the decision, which was just at the beginning of HS2, uh, of the lockdown, sorry, I suspect it reflected real confidence in the West Midlands economy and the value of rail investment um, in supporting the economy going forward. And, you know, it's major opportunities again for employment and radical change of places in the West Midlands to actually, Curzon Street Station takes an unused part of Birmingham currently and turns it into a place that is really used. Um, Moore Street Station, which I'm 
very proud of because I was very much part of the restoration of the great westernry of it becomes an even more important place um, I'm not so sure I quite like the the new bridge on this but that's another matter um, it creates a whole new vibrant heart of the second city of this country um, We've also found, although I think it's been lost already, I love those two pictures of Northern Italy showing the reduction in, um, uh, in pollution in, in Northern Italy during the lockdown. And so the decarbonisation agenda is made even more stark, I think, and more visible by um, uh, the COVID lockdown. And as I said, my sort of Botley Road, Oxford, completely even more packed with cars than it was before, I don't know if it's the same for you in Leamington and Warwick, uh, is not a tenable way forward. So I think the railway then offers its contribution to new ways of living, working and moving about, how it supports the environmental bonus. I mean, just to give you an example there, um, in South Worcestershire, the South Worcestershire Development Plan, um, there are 44, 42,000 houses committed to being built around Worcester, adjacent to the Cotswold line, the Worcester, Oxford, London line, in the next 20 years. That's something like the city of Worcester and its population, 100,000 plus, added on around Worcester. It's not really conceivable that those can all be, those new people can all live there with uh, cars as the means of getting around. So how can we see the railway as part of leading recovery and needing recovery? And I think it comes back in a sense to the question that's been put already about how do we radically look at even major things like HS2. We have to be willing to think uh, afresh about what we do. And so I, I just sort of, I, in thinking about this, I, I love the film 2001 A Space Odyssey and it was just making me think about the new thinking because in it, you know, in a sense, it, it encompasses being locked down and kept in and kept away from other human beings. It, it summarizes that kind of fear, incredible fear and an and alarm and um, at what is facing us, the sheer scale and uncertainty of what is facing us. But it then with the star child at the end says, well, we've got a new way of looking at things. So what does this mean in kind of summary terms, conscious of our time, uh, in terms of questions that I think are pertinent to the railway? Well, the first is what will happen to passenger demand? Now, at the moment, passenger demand is around 30% of what it was. Car travel has gone back to 90% of what it was. Bus travel has gone back to about 50% of what it was. Um, and there's both quantity but the nature of demand will change because it will change over time and in the day there will be less commuting to the places like London and Birmingham and Manchester but in fact places like um, Leamington Spa, Worcester, Stafford, Oxford, um, Ludlow uh, many of the smaller towns and cities in this country may well become much more important places where people want to get to them closer to home. So there may well be a fundamental shift in what we do and how we travel. That may not mean that the railway is irrelevant. The railway is deeply relevant in my view, um, but it becomes um, quite a different set of, of, of forms of travel that we don't quite know what will happen yet? So that questions on that third bullet point, what levels of train service will be needed? To some extent, um, we were running so many trains on the network and you heard all the criticisms to the railway about overcrowding and poor performance, trains running late. We have an opportunity perhaps to maybe run slightly different, slightly lesser service levels with longer trains and that perform better, that you may have more space and less late running, more reliable trains, and that may have an attraction in its own right. There are other things the railway will have to adapt to. If you, you know, here we are in Warwickshire, some of the poorest wards in the United Kingdom are to the east of Birmingham, between Birmingham and uh, Coleshill. 
um, uh, that eastern part of Birmingham, some of the most uh, economically and socially challenged in the country. Uh, can the railway fundamentally do different things in providing better services on, say, the routes between Birmingham Leicester and Birmingham Derby that can support some of the social level social levelling that is undeniably needed in this country? I've mentioned decarbonisation, and uh, you know. Within the railway, it's not just that trains are more are less, less polluting than cars, it's that we're now down the line of battery trains, hydrogen technology, as well as more electrification. Um, that I think will contribute powerfully to the role of the railway going forward. And then finally, there's devolution. Now, I don't know if you're aware that the West Midlands Trains franchise, not the Chiltern one, but the West Midlands Trains franchise is co-managed between the Department for Transport and the what's called the West Midlands Rail Executive, of which Warwickshire is a member authority. You've heard all the fuss going on this week about the tensions between government and the mayors and, uh, and so on of, of, of English uh, uh, urban areas. Uh, we also know that we've got devolved Scotland and devolved Wales in different ways. Um, how COVID is going to pan out in whether government wants to centralise decision making about transport or continue to support devol devolution with more local control is an open question. One thing I can tell you about the splendid county of Warwick is it has delivered Warwick Parkway, Colesa Parkway, Stratford Parkway, Bermuda Park, Kenilworth in the last 20 years. There is no other Shire County that has done that as successfully. Um, obviously Chilton had rather a bit of an impact on making Warwick Parkway happen because it's owned by Chilton. But that's a real, Warwickshire is an exemplar of uh, devolved control of in effect the county saying, well, this is what we need and we're gonna do it because government otherwise won't do it. So I think there are a, a massive variety of questions the one thing I think most particularly is that there is a critical role for the railway going forward in both supporting whatever the new world of work is and supporting the devolution agenda. And I'll stop now to take questions.